Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that involves the death of a truly amazing woman. I'm so surprised that her case has not been covered more. So that's why when I came across Suzanne's case, I decided that I needed to talk about it and share her story. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Bright Sellers. I've been using Bright Sellers for quite some time now and they never failed to impress me. Bright Sellers is a wine subscription service where you take a quick seven question quiz and they will match you with wines from all over the world curated to your specific taste palette. I love Bright Cellars because I never know what kind of wines that I like. In the past, I've always just picked one based on the label and how much I like the label and then I get home and sometimes I don't even like it. So it just ends up sitting on the shelf until one of my roommates decides to drink it because if I don't like it, then I don't want to drink it. But Bright Cellars has completely erased that stress for me. Every bottle of wine comes with a wine education card for each bottle giving you tasting notes, suggested pairings, and the best serving temperatures as well as their origins. Bright Cellars also selects less than 2% of sampled wines to make sure that we are getting the best wines from the best wine regions in the world. One of the wines I have is called Mohave Rain. This is a red blend from California, which has red currant, raspberry, cherry, and black pepper flavors. This one was definitely a more risky one for me because I don't typically like red wines, so they picked out a red blend for me. This one has the perfect amount of fruity taste without being too sweet. I am so happy I tried this one because my roommates especially love red wine, so this was like the perfect medium between their love for red wine and my hesitation with red wine. We drank the whole bottle, so you know this one's good. I also have another flavor called Forever Fleeting, a white blend from Spain. This one has flavors of white peach, nectarine, dried herbs, and apple blossom. This was definitely my favorite of the bunch and has the perfect balance of fruity and floral flavors. Once again, this bottle is already empty because my roommates and I just could not stop drinking this one. Another amazing thing that I love about Bright Cellars is that their packaging is completely recyclable, it's plastic-free, and it leaves the smallest carbon footprint in the industry. Now, for a limited time only, Bright Cellars is offering my viewers a special discount. When you use my link down below, you can get 50% off of your first six bottle box. That comes out to only $55, including shipping, that is such a great deal because that literally comes out to less than $10 per bottle. So again, make sure you use my link down below, take the quiz and figure out your wine matches and get your first box for 50% off. Thank you again so much to Bright Sellers for sponsoring today's video and for your support of my channel. It's sponsors like them that allow me to continue making the content that I create and sharing these incredibly important stories. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Suzanne Eaton. Suzanne Eaton was born on December 23rd, 1959 to her parents, Glinda Williams Eaton and Robert Eaton in Oakland, California. But when she was 11 years old, her family moved to Westchester County in New York. From there, she attended Briam Hills High School, graduating in 1977. She had a sister named Julie and a brother named Robert. Suzanne was married to a man named Dr. Tony Hyman, another scientist, and together, they had two children, Max and Luke. According to Suzanne's mother, Glinda, Suzanne was curious, motivated, and intelligent from the day she was born. She loved books, music, taekwondo, and playing piano. She was described as having a calm, thoughtful, steady personality while having a level of outgoingness and flamboyancy about her. Her son, Max, described her as being a woman who lived her life with few regrets. She had a full-time career, but she was able to balance that with being an amazing, involved mother who did everything she could to make the lives of her children better. She was supportive, encouraging, nurturing, and supported anything and everything her eager young boys were interested in. Before going into college, Suzanne had been torn between having a career in mathematics, literature, or biology. However, she eventually decided on biology after realizing that her learning would be from scientific literature rather than dated textbooks. Suzanne had earned a biology degree from Brown University in 1981, then she went on to get her PhD in microbiology from UCLA in 1988, 
Then she got her postdoc in developmental biology at UCSF. Also in 1988, Suzanne was awarded the Sydney C. Rittenberg Award for Distinguished Academic Achievement in Microbiology by the Association of Academic Women for her doctoral work. From there, she worked in the field of developmental biology at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg, Germany. Then she moved on to the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Biology and Genetics in Dresden, Germany. Here, she was a founding group leader and a professor at the Biotechnology Center of the Technical University of Dresden. She was wildly intelligent, and those at Max Planck Society attribute much of their success as one of the world's leading institutions and in making them a beacon of science known all over the world to her. Those who worked with her described her as having a wonder and curiosity for the world, and she wanted to deeply understand life's intricate inner workings. Researchers at Max Planck Institute said, quote, she was a world world-renowned scientist who was a key player in developmental biology, respected and loved by the wide international community. Over the years, she focused her brilliant mind on addressing questions in signaling, tissue mechanics, and more recently, regulation of metabolism during development. She has been integral in bringing mathematical modeling to a predominantly experimental field. Her biggest research question was to study how cells form tissues. The Max Planck Institute's memorial page for Suzanne states, quote, thanks to her insatiable curiosity and creativity, she discovered new and groundbreaking approaches to understanding how cells communicate with each other to form tissues. Through the discovery of signaling molecules, the morphogens, and their physical properties and interactions, Suzanne's team was able to explain how signals are spread over long distances in tissues. Most recently, Suzanne's research focused on the interaction of signaling and metabolic pathways. But her son Max said that beyond her incredible intelligence for her field of work, she was so much more than a scientist. She would help her children with anything that they needed in school, and she would go out of her way to make sure that she thoroughly explained everything that she could to them. She absolutely loved music as well, Max said, quote, her love for music shone brightly. Her eyes lit up every time she talked about a piece she was playing, and she would laugh with me in the ad of sheer complexity of a piano arrangement. I have many fond memories of her and my father playing duets together, filling our home with a beautiful, joyful sound that was unique to them, and I shall forever cherish the memory of lying on the floor, watching and listening to the thing that brought them together. Suzanne's sister said, quote, she took great pleasure in preparing exquisite meals and had an exotic fashion sense. She loved perfume. She taught and practiced Taekwondo as a second degree black belt. She finished crossword puzzles way too quickly, played concertos, and read extensively. She fit Jane Austen's strictest description of an accomplished woman while maintaining a natural humility and insatiable curiosity. She worried that it was impossible to give both her science and her family her all, but anyone who read of her accomplishments in the field of molecular and developmental biology, or who witnessed her joy in tutoring, comforting, and inspiring her children, or sharing with and loving her husband, would not have suspected. With a deep sensitivity and compassion, she somehow made us all a priority. So it's very clear that not only did Suzanne make a huge impact on her family and those she loved, but to the scientific community as well. She discovered groundbreaking research that can help us understand how life works from the very cells that create life. Obviously, I don't understand all the in and outs of what she has researched and what she's discovered, but I do know that any scientific discoveries regarding how cells work and how they contribute to metabolic processes, this can lay the groundwork for further research into how to cure diseases, how to create vaccines, how to have just better practices in medicine, and so many other things that can help humanity in the long run. So, not only did she embody intelligence, but her research will go on to help so, so many people for so many years to come. She truly was an amazing mother and scientist. In July of 2019, Suzanne had been attending a scientific conference on insect hormones at the Orthodox Academy in Galampi in the city of Kana on the island of Crete in Greece. This was a conference that she had attended many times in the past. A few days into the conference, she had been scheduled to present to another group 
of researchers about her findings regarding how certain molecules can influence embryonic development in fruit flies. However, on Tuesday, July 2nd, at around 3 p.m., Suzanne was entertaining other guests in the lobby of the conference with her piano playing. Afterwards, colleagues of Suzanne's remember seeing that she left for a run sometime between 3 and 5 p.m. She often went on these runs just to stay in shape, and she would run for about 30 minutes at a time. However, she was supposed to attend a lecture at 6 p.m. that same evening, but she did not show up. Her colleagues were really surprised when they didn't see her at this lecture, but like I said, she was scheduled to speak on Thursday, so her colleagues thought that maybe she had just been busy preparing her speech, and that is why she just lost track of time and skipped it. But that next morning, she also was not seen at one of the morning sessions of the conference. Once again, her colleagues did notice her absence, but people weren't too concerned until it came time for her cycling session that she had scheduled with a friend, and she also did not attend that. By dinner time on July 3rd, all of her colleagues collectively realized that none of them had seen Suzanne in over 24 hours by that point. Again, this was a conference, a pretty big conference, so I'm sure there were people here and there that did notice her absence, but they probably just assumed that she was with other colleagues at the conference. But when they all got together and realized that nobody had seen her, they started to panic. This is when they got the Greek police involved to start searching for her. Immediately, police went into Suzanne's room and they realized that she left behind her passport, her phone, her wallet, and her keys. The only thing that they noticed was missing was her running shoes. That same night, police started going door to door to figure out who had seen Suzanne, where, and when to try and figure out a timeline. At this point, they found absolutely no sign of her anywhere and they really had no idea where to go from there. So, in the days that followed, the Greek police, the fire brigade, and all of the other searches ramped up their search efforts. They searched the area around the conference using sniffer dogs, they had an infrared helicopter, and they requested help from the German government since that is where Suzanne had been living at the time. In addition to this, over 70 volunteers from the conference as well as her family, they all came out to help with the searches for Suzanne. In the initial stages of the searches for Suzanne, police thought that it was possible that that due to the rough terrain as well as the extreme heat at the time that Suzanne went on her run, they thought that it was most likely possible that she became overheated and started searching for shade and that she had passed out somewhere. Either that or maybe she had fallen somewhere on her run. They focused their searches in the nearby ravines, trail edges, bush, and any shady areas. But anybody who knew Suzanne knew that she was a very strong athlete. She was an avid runner and a senior black belt in Taekwondo. So they thought that if there was anybody who would be able to fight themselves out of a dangerous situation like this, it would be her. Within days of searching, Suzanne's friends came together to offer a 56,000 US dollar reward for anybody who could provide information that leads to finding Suzanne. They also received about $30,000 in donations to help fund further search and rescue efforts. However, only a few days after the searches started, they came to a screeching halt. On July 8th, Suzanne's body was found. Now, it has been reported differently depending on what source you look at. Some say that she was found as a part of the search efforts, but others say that she was found just by happenstance by people who were out exploring the area. Either way, Suzanne's body had been located in an abandoned World War II bunker located in a secluded area on the northwest side of the island, located about six miles away from where Suzanne was last seen. This bunker is a part of a series of man-made caves and tunnels built by the Nazis used to store ammunition during their occupation of Crete in World War II. It was reported that her body was found about 200 feet deep into the bunker. She was reportedly found under a wooden pallet and her body was covered in burlap. One article explained that this bunker is very difficult to access and the entrance is covered by a bunch of trees, so the area is very hard to see or or to access. Here is a video going around the area where she was found, including the entrance.
Περίμενε, μήνε. Περίμενε, περίμενε. Το είμαι και εγώ φως. Εγώ θέλω και εκείνο να το... Ωραία, από... Εγώ είμαι... νιώθω ικανοποιημένη. Το ίδιο πράγμα θα Μην Γιάννη. Να πάμε λίγο προς τα εκεί, να δούμε. Ε, θέλω μια φωτογραφία. Ε, ε, Τέρα. Τρία. Δύο. Δεν το στενεύει, δε. Πάμε πίσω. Πάμε πίσω. Κοίτα εδώ. Ε! Έλα. When her body was initially found there, police pondered if maybe Suzanne had become very overheated and then went in there because it was the first thing that was around and then went in there for some shade and to cool off. However, after investigating the scene further and seeing the condition of Suzanne's body, it was clear to authorities that Suzanne had been murdered and her body had been dragged to that area. They found that there were wheel marks, so tire marks leading up to the shelter's drain, so they thought that it was probable that she had been murdered and then taken there afterwards. Then, after the autopsy was completed, it was found that Suzanne had been brutally attacked. It was found that she had died as a result of asphyxiation, most likely from her attacker putting his hands over her throat and her mouth. She had multiple broken ribs, multiple broken bones in her face, and multiple injuries to her hands and her arms. She had many small stab wounds all around her body, and there were signs of a vicious sexual attack. But due to just how secluded the area was where her body was found, police knew that they needed to start looking into locals as their main suspects. So they knew that it wasn't people attending the conference, they knew that it probably wasn't anybody who knew Suzanne or had anything against her personally, they knew that it had to be somebody who knew the area very well. So they started talking to anybody that they could around the area and there were two witnesses who actually saw Suzanne on the day that she went missing. There was one man, an 85-year-old farmer, who reportedly saw Suzanne walking very quickly near the village of Ephrata, about 4.5 kilometers away from the cave where her body was found. He said that when he saw the missing persons posters of her come out, he immediately recognized her. He also described the clothing that she was wearing when he saw her, and they were confirmed as being the same clothing that she was last seen in when she went on this run. So, this led police to two possible conclusions. Either she was killed and her body was dumped in the area, or she ran all the way to these caves and was murdered there. So, this brought in the area that police needed to search. 
They swept all around old warehouses, farmhouses, and around neighborhoods anywhere that they could to see if there was any evidence that could lead them to who did this to Suzanne. They also started collecting DNA from all of their suspects to see if they could match it to DNA found on Suzanne's body. So, police started questioning people around the area who were known to frequent the tunnel systems, as well as people who were known to be very familiar with these systems. When doing so, there was one man in particular who police noticed was giving conflicting statements. This was a 27-year-old man named Giannis Parasakis. Now, Giannis is the son of a priest, and his family as a whole are all very active in the church. He worked as a local farmer and woodworker in the area, and he had served in the Air Force. He had been married for three years at this point, and he had two young children, a three-year-old little boy and a two-year-old little girl. His family lived in Malame, and his father owned some land near the bunker. Giannis was also very active on social media and was known to frequently post videos of himself exploring the abandoned Nazi bunkers. Family described Giannis as being a calm man who liked telling jokes. He loved taking videos of himself and everything that he was doing. Others around him described him as being eccentric with a very big personality. In one video, Giannis said, quote, I deal with sports and Eastern martial arts, Shaolin Kung Fu. I love what I do, but at the same time, I take care of some of the animals already protected. I also deal with modeling. My dream is to become a great battle monk, Shaolin. I am proud of myself that I have reached this point. Now, if that sounds a little bit choppy, it's because it's translated, so it's not exactly what he said, but it's the best translation to English that I was able to find. When he was initially questioned, Giannis said that he hadn't been over to that bunker in over a month, and he also said that he didn't know Suzanne and had absolutely nothing to do with her death. However, turns out police actually saw his car captured on surveillance video in the exact area where she went missing, and the tires on his car matched the tire marks that led right up to the bunker where Suzanne's body was found. Then the police decided to take a look at Giannis's cell phone. It showed that he had been using his cell phone on July 2nd, and his cell phone data showed that he was in fact near the bunker on the same day around the same time that Suzanne was dumped in that bunker. After being confronted with this information, very quickly Giannis cracked. He confessed that he was the one who raped and murdered Suzanne Eaton on July 2nd, 2019. He said that he was looking for somebody who he could hook up with, and that is when he spotted Suzanne running. So, he said that he just happened to see her there by chance, so he randomly decided that this was the woman that he was going to target. He said that he then hit Suzanne with his car two times in order to render her defenseless. Then he covered her mouth and then forced her into the trunk of his car where he then drove her down to the bunker. He said that he raped her at the bunker before he dumped her in the location that she would later be found. Again, like I said, she was found with numerous small stab wounds, a ton of broken bones, but her actual cause of death was suffocation. So, of course, after this confession and all of the evidence that confirmed that he was in the area, he was arrested and charged with Suzanne's murder. The trial for murder started in October of 2020, and he was being charged with manslaughter, rape, and the possession of an illegal weapon. The police officer who questioned Giannis said that he confessed to the murder after about six hours of police interrogation, and he said that Giannis initially said that he was possessed by demons who were giving him orders. So, it seemed that he was initially saying this so that maybe he could plea insanity or something like that because I didn't see this brought up after this at all. So, I don't know if he was still claiming that at the trial or if that's just something that he initially said during these, you know, initial police interviews. During his initial confession, he also said that he actually blames his porn use on his actions of killing Suzanne. 
he said that his life was just miserable and he had been watching a lot of hardcore porn and he was on a bender to liven up his miserable life. He said that when he was driving around and he spotted Suzanne, his motive was only to rape her, not to actually kill her. So he hit her with his car to immobilize her but when she was knocked unconscious, that's when he put her in the trunk of his car and then raped her before dumping her body. He said that after he dumped her body, he brought his car to a nearby graveyard to thoroughly clean the car of any evidence. However, during the trial, he actually changed his statement and said that he had made this confession when he was under a great deal of distrust, and he said that him hitting Suzanne with his car was actually an accident, and and then he completely denied that he even raped her. However, like I mentioned earlier, evidence showed that his tires literally matched the marks that led right up to where her body was found. His cell phone shows that he was in the area when she went missing and his car was seen on surveillance video. Then we know that there was evidence of her being raped and suffocated, so that completely gets rid of the possibility that he didn't rape her or the possibility that he didn't kill her on purpose. So knowing all of this, her injuries show that he didn't just accidentally hit her and then dump her body to avoid being caught, you know, in a state of him freaking out and not wanting to get in trouble for accidentally hitting someone because, you know, he had this amazing life that he needed to get back to. Her injuries literally showed that she was raped and she was suffocated, so there's no possible way that he can get away with just saying, I accidentally hit her car and I know this was a terrible decision to hide her body, but that's what I did in a state of panic, blah, 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 blah. We know that he raped and suffocated her, so there was no way of getting out of that. So by the end of his trial in October of 2020, Giannis Parasankis was sentenced to life in prison for killing Suzanne and 13 years for the rape. Of course, his defense did submit an appeal, but as far as I've seen, nothing has come of it. So, unfortunately, that is all I know for this case. Now, I will say that I'm sure there's a lot more to this case, but given that it happened in Greece and, you know, not a lot of the articles were even in English and it was very difficult to translate and a lot of the articles that I could find just just didn't give you a lot of information. It was really difficult to find any more detailed information on the actual crime. It actually took a lot of digging and a lot of patience to even find the information that I did put forth, so as far as I can tell, that seems to be all that's been released about this case, but if you guys know more about anything that I didn't mention that has to do with this case, please let me know in the comments below. Either way, I am so absolutely devastated for Suzanne and her family. She seemed like such an amazing woman who is making huge strides in the scientific community and there's no doubt that she would have gone on to do so many more amazing things in her life and in her career. I'm so impressed with all of the information that I was able to find about Suzanne as a person from her colleagues, the people she worked with, and her family and her friends. Like I just said, it was a little bit frustrating that I couldn't find a lot of information about the actual crime that happened, but I'm so, so very impressed about the information that I was able to find about her because at the end of the day, that is what truly matters. I'm so happy I was able to share with you all all of the amazing things that she's done in her life, all of the people that she has impacted in such a positive way. I'm so happy that I was able to share her story with you all so that you all know that so many things that happen in your life, whether it be medicine, whether it be getting a vaccine, anything like that, Suzanne was a part of that. Suzanne was a part of making and creating and researching so many things that benefit you every single day of your life. So I'm really happy that I got the opportunity to speak about Suzanne and who she was and all of the amazing things that she was able to do with her short life. I'm so, so very disgusted that she was literally just innocently running, trying to stay active and healthy and on a whim, a man ran her down with his car and decided to rape her and then after raping her he killed her and I think that he meant to kill her. I think that he did go into this with the intent just to rape her and to maybe make her unconscious so that she couldn't fight back 
but at some point, I think he decided that he needed to dump her body so that she couldn't tell police what he just did to her. Maybe she regained consciousness while this was happening to her. Maybe she fought him back with everything she had and he decided in that moment that he needed to get rid of her so that he wouldn't get in trouble. But little did he know that he killed someone who affected so many people's lives, who did so many amazing things with her life. I did see in one article that he genuinely thought that he was going to get away with this. He really thought that he outsmarted police. He really thought that he was not going to have to take responsibility for his actions. But he killed someone who meant a lot to a lot of people, so he picked the wrong woman. He picked someone who everyone was searching for tirelessly until they found her, and they did, and pretty quickly they figured out who was responsible, so I guess that was one lucky break that they had was that this person was so arrogant, so irresponsible that he thought that he could just dump her like trash and that nobody was ever going to find her and that he was never going to have to accept responsibility for what he did. I feel sorry for him that he's living such a miserable life. I'm sure what he said initially about him feeling miserable was true, but he seemed to have everything going for him. He had faithful family who was active in the church and probably wanted what was best for him. He had a wife and he had two young children and for some reason he just felt entitled to her body, to Suzanne, and he felt that because his life is so miserable that he needs to take somebody else's from them or that he's entitled to them or whatever. It makes me so terrified for just any woman anywhere who decides to go on a run by herself or who decides to do anything out in public, God forbid, by herself. It's truly, truly terrifying. So all I can really say with this is just make sure someone knows where you are at all times. If you are a woman, especially if you're a woman who's in a place that you're not familiar with. I know she had been here multiple times before, but if you're on vacation, if you're on a trip, if you're anywhere, even if you're near your home, just make sure that somebody knows where you are. Make sure you give them a timeline of when you're going to be back, which was a great thing for Suzanne because most people knew pretty much right away that she should be back by now. So it's an unfortunate reality that we women have to live with, but that's just how it is. So if you are someone who enjoys running outside, if you're someone who enjoys hiking alone or anything like that, just please make sure that you protect yourself, bring mace. I personally have like a little hunting knife that I bring with me when I go hiking. I have a taser. So anything that you can bring with you that is light enough that you can just carry it, that you can pop in a fanny pack, anything like that is so beneficial. Just Make sure you're aware of your surroundings. Of course, only run with one headphone in instead of two. Make sure that you're just being aware of your surroundings. Again, it's something that we shouldn't have to do, but that's the world that we live in. So that is my advice to you, and that is something that we can learn from Suzanne's case. But either way, that is all I have for today's video, and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that this whole, you know, porn thing with him having a miserable life, do you think that truly was Giannis's motive? How do you think this went down? And do you think that he actually did mean to kill her? Let me know all of your thoughts and theories in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. I will be coming out with some Halloween related videos in the coming weeks, so make sure you keep an eye out for that. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And don't forget to use my link down below and head to Bright Sellers to take their quiz. Find the wines that match you and you will get 50% off of your first box. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!